Let's go! The man with the golden Rolodex. Neil Forrester doesn't just have a golden Rolodex, he has the best stories to go with it. Having worked with the likes of Mike Tyson, Conor McGregor, and Lady Gaga, Neil's bold creative thinking drove his success. But something was on. He was the man in Canada, but he wasn't the man at home. He decided to make a change. change, change, change. Now as owner of the Substance Group, Neil uses his connections to spearhead philanthropic causes, having started the first ever job fair for those with autism. Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Forrester. Straight out of the t dot. That's what it is. Live from the six boroughs. Don't go nowhere. For sure. Welcome to Standing in the Six with your host, Michael and Constantine. It was fun. It was fun. And, you know, uh, here we are Monday morning right now, excited right now and what's coming up. Okay, so look, rep basketball, that whole dynamic of like next level. There's house league. Yes. You know, there's kids that are at home. Yes. And then there's kids that play on right. their own. That's right. And then there's kids that play organized sport. Yes. House league. And then there's kids who play rep. Yeah. In the rep circle, mm -hmm. describe it. What What is it about rep? I mean, like, is it is it something that all kids should aspire to be a part of i think i think uh being a rep parent for the past four years it's opened up my eyes you have really i think two kinds of people okay and maybe three but two you have um first of all anyone that's in rep it means they really love ball and they're trying to you know just take their game to the next level however i think anyone that's also in rep sports is put in there by their parents that their parents feel the kid has talent and it's gonna take them to a paycheck in the NBA. Yes, it's okay. very real. So even at the young age, it's yes, like, 100%. this is gonna translate to dollars. This is a 100%. Career. And yeah. here's what blows my mind. Why I have my daughter, Hannah, into basketball and my son, Mike, in basketball. They love the game. They absolutely love it, okay? Um, they both have aspirations to do professional careers, right? And even though my son, you know, says that he'd love to be in the NBA, uh, I'm a realist, not to say I'm crushing any sort of dreams. However, man, the amount of parents that I've come across over the years that, uh, you know, feel their children is going to make a professional uh, debut uh, in, in the NBA or whatever sport that may be. I'm not just talking about basketball. I'm talking uh, about hockey. all sports, soccer, okay, hockey. Anything. It's, it's actually, it's actually. I think it's kind of quite sad, to be honest with you, because what you're doing is you're putting all your eggs in the one basket of it has to work here. I've heard parents say to their kids, what were you doing? This is your um, scholarship we're talking about. And the kid's like 11. Okay, so okay. it's already, these, yeah. these are the stakes that are being dangled in and, front of them. And if you hear, I, I do a lot of background uh, research into, you know, rep sports and kids and development. If you really want to take a kid out of the game mentally and put pressure on him and be that Tito Jackson, or sorry, not Tito, Joe Jackson and whip him into basically being Michael, I mean, go for it. I mean, but what's the damage that's going to happen out of that, right? So for me, my kids are in it because they love it. And I will do whatever they want as long as they love the game. Mm -hmm. The minute it starts becoming like this is work, I mean, you've lost the fun aspect of things. I mean, if they want to go there, that's fine. But I think because it is a game. Yeah, but I, I find parents are pushing so much pressure on kids, and everybody thinks their kids amazing, right? Everyone thinks their kids are amazing. But here's what I always say: for people that think their kids great, there's a kid somewhere in New York, living in the, in the hood right now, that has no food that they don't have enough money to, to make, you know, each day, you know, to survive. And he's on the court now trying to find his way out. And he's putting in 10, 12 hours a day of basketball every single day because to him, it has to be about survival. And you take that kid and see how skilled he is. And those are true stories of players like, I think, I'm mean, going to think Kevin Garnett, I think, was one of those players. There's a number where it was like their only option. Right. It was their only option. And, and that is what people need to understand is what you're going up against when you're thinking my kid's going to make it pro. Yeah, I mean, that's anyone, there's some guys, we know some guys that fight Muay Thai and when they go to Thailand to train, right? they get, they have a rude awakening because here they do it for sport. There, that seven-year-old who's fighting in, in an organized match is actually fighting in order to get enough money to buy rice so that the entire family can actually eat a bowl of rice for the day. Look, look that, at look at the Khabib fight. The guy's wrestling bears. Yeah. At the age of what? Five years old? Five, six years old? He's wrestling bears. Yeah. 
This is his life. Guaranteed. And he some, did it for fun, by the way. Guaranteed somewhere, probably on the west coast of, of North America, someone's opening up a gym with, you know. <laughs> with bears. Yeah, with bears. They yeah. learned the, they learned the secret. Exactly. <laughs> claw. Exactly. Hey. So, the claw club. So <laughs> at the claw club, we yeah. train you in primitive ways. So that's the world of rep, man. It's, really, it's fun. It's fun. But at the end of the day, it's also, like I said, what I see it's like there's a lot of cloud and unicorns and rainbows and fairy dusts and all that that people just kind of like get blinded a bit by speaking of clouds yeah. <laughs> and rainbows and fairy dust and unicorns yes we have a great guest today uh, neil forrester of the substance group who he's been heavily in the music scene heavily in, in a number of different scenes as, as a marketing guru a guy who's just kind of taken he just says that he knows how to take something as a seed and grow it into something beautiful and how to leverage it and make the most of it so you know it's going to be really cool hearing him today just to see what he has to say nice yeah nice yeah should we bring him in yeah let's do it all right let's do it okay. let's go we've talked about that before just tour life kind of going around um you know um you have extensive experience going around the country being with a-listers celebrities music artists what if you just had to sum it up quick if someone say imagine you just you're on the go train and some guy sees your text and says, oh, hey, you used to, uh, you know, I saw you on that show standing in the six, you know, <laughs> uh, what's it like? What's it like? If like literally sh- shooting from the hip, what's it like that life? Um, draining, exhausting. <laughs> uh, um, what's that? What's the word I'm looking for? Um, when you get like no credit, like what's the word I'm unrewarding Ve- that's the word hmm. very unrewarding wow extremely hmm. unrewarding it's one of the reasons why i got out of that industry yeah it's it's uh look we were talking earlier i'm 42 now just turned 42 last mm-hmm. week <clears throat> so you kind of you kind of learn as you get older and um yeah you get cut up in the hype i'm touring with justin bieber he's my guy whoever the celebrity is that you're with at the time and you go from city to city and people are rolling out the red carpet and uh the lifestyle can get a bit sort of like alluring um but when you go home and that's not around and you look at what you have or what you've lost or what your sort of where your current situation is mm. you know you you reevaluate everything and for me i was fortunate i had kids when i was really young when i was 24 and 26 respectively mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so i always had something to come back to and seeing my kids like every other week or every two weeks traveling and not being there missing this occasion or getting in a fight with their mom because I wasn't around and yeah, I'm making money. I'm making good money and I'm the man in Canada, but I'm not the man in my own household. Mm. Right. And so, um, you quickly learn to, uh, sort of evaluate that and and look back. Some people don't have that and they stay in that industry for a long time. But for me, after a while, I was kind of like, nah, this is not rewarding. I'm not happy. Um, and I, I've been lucky. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't do drugs. I think that's kind of been part of the reasons why I've had, moderate success throughout the nightclub and concert days because I wasn't going into town trying to yep. do any of that stuff. Well, you navigated through it soberly. <laughs> it, well, it's true, yeah. right? I mean, we'd be, not me, but the artists would be popping Hennessy with girls this, that, the other, and I'm the guy counting the money or making sure everything's, our drivers are ready and pick up in the mornings ready. Um, and so, um, I, uh, I, uh, was able to sort of just really take a step back, but the one thing that I that I have is uh, I'm emotional, mm-hmm. and so at the time I didn't realize it, but I was getting in a lot of fights. <laughs> like I'd be on tour. <laughs> yeah. I did a t- I did a show in 2013 with Young Jeezy in Vancouver. I got in two fist fights in one night at the venue. Mm-hmm. Why? Um, one was the opening acts manager. Um, they were running late. They were too busy trying to like get all their homies in, this, that, the other, and the show was running late. We had one dressing room, and because I had a relationship with them, I, I kind of allowed them to be in Jeezy's dressing room, but I had about a 20-minute turnover time, and they were running 20 minutes late. So when their set ended, Jeezy was just leaving the hotel, which was only 10 minutes away. So I'm like, get out, get out, we're running late, I need you out of here, and they're smoking weed, and they're doing their thing. So finally, the uh, the road manager's kind of just being, just being ignorant. I'm like, bro, you need to get out of my face. Mm-hmm. He's like, why, man? What? Like, just kind of pushing me, trying to keep it PG, but a lot of F words, this, that, the other. And I just looked at him. I was in a DJ booth trying to make sure that we could transition right. over. And I go, listen, man, I go, I'm going to tell you one last time. Get out of my face or there's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. So we get to the dressing room and he, he says something like, you know, you're a real bitch, Neil. And that was it. Slapped him up. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then not 
20, 30 minutes later, I saw a guy in Vancouver that I had a, an issue with, a business issue with. And I told the owners, I said, listen, do not let this guy in the venue. He has no purpose there. He doesn't work there. He has nothing to do with the show. I'm coming to Vancouver. I'm bringing a sold out show. If he's there, I'm like, there's going to be a problem because mm-hmm. he owes me a lot of money. So let's just avoid him being there. So sure enough, he's there. <laughs> and he sees me and I'm at the side of the stage and I'm kind of like my, my, I want to kill him because he owes me a lot of money. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I'm also trying to be professional. Right. But it was, that was it. He kind of looked at me, he walked towards me, I jumped off the, uh, the stage and I just did what jump. I did. Yeah. Ooh, yeah stage st- jump. St- um, stopped him out a little and then security's pulling me off him, throwing us both out. I have to go through the back door. It was bad. And you know what? I'm not a violent guy by nature. I'm not like, I don't go causing trouble, but I was in a, an environment where I wasn't just I wasn't happy mm-hmm. so I was quickly set off right mm-hmm. it was the same thing with my nightclub days when I used to promote nightclubs I was a man all that blah 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 and, and then kind of 10 years into it the bouncers that used to work for me were like dude we're breaking up fights with you more than ourselves like it's crazy right now you're getting in fights every other weekend and I would never start them but you know you're in a nightclub people are drunk people are high people are whatever they are and some would step on you or push you or say the wrong thing and it would just set me off. Yeah. At the time, I didn't know what the hell was wrong with me. I look back now and I, that, that was my way of coping with not being happy versus drinking and drowning my sorrows in alcohol or doing drugs, right? So um, it got it got bad. The, the concert stuff, I was I got in fights with artist managers. I got in a fight with Fabulous's six foot, true story, six foot 10, guys, 450 pounds, bodyguard, his bodyguard to this day. We got into a, we got into it uh, Pusha T was there standing there laughing he's like yo he's like you're crazy man that guy's like four times your size yeah I was like dude I, I just wasn't happy yeah I know I, like right now obviously we know you're the CEO of the substance group mm-hmm. when you're saying what you were doing back in the club days what would you what would your title then like what would you call yourself uh, I, was, I guess at the time like just a promoter mm-hmm. um, okay. although you know I feel like what I was doing what I accomplished in the in, in that industry was was more than what you consider a promoter. I wasn't handing out flyers. I had 30 full-time staff. We were grossing a couple million dollars a year at 24 or 25. I was doing 3,000 people on Friday at government and 3,000 on Saturday at the docks. I was running three live to airs. Like, so it was a serious operation. I had a big office at, not a big office, but an office with a bunch of full-time staff and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I was a promoter. Uh, I'm not ashamed of that, but I think I don't know what the right word would be to describe it because I wasn't like these other dudes who are just standing on a corner and handle flyers. But how did you yeah. get to that? How did you get to the point where, like, I mean, I know some of your stories, uh, you know. I mean, I think it would be cool for you to tell us some of the stories about, uh, what was it Drake's uncle calling you? Oh, yeah. What, what, what are they calling? <laughs> so well, how, how, so, did you, how did you get to that point where people know, let me call Neil? So, um, like I mentioned, uh, I'm, I'm a passionate person with anything in life. And I was actually telling somebody this on my way in is, I think every eight to ten years, I engulf myself in whatever I'm doing. So if I'm, if I'm promoting clubs, if I'm whatever I do, I just consume myself with it to the point where I think after eight to ten years, I'm just I'm tired of it. I'm sick yeah. of it. You exhausted. I'm out. Just ex- burnt yeah. myself out. And so I'm I'm always I've I've been an entrepreneur since I was twelve. I had a booth at the flea market at twelve years old. Mm-hmm. And so when I what you sell? Do you mind? Uh, funny enough, it's going to sound funny. Um, I had two booths. The first booth I had, I was selling massagers like personal massagers yeah, 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 yeah. which you put on your back and then the second time I had a booth at the Pickering Flea Market I sold boxer shorts and they were like no, this is like 20 years ago right like novelty boxer shorts where um, they would glow in the dark or they would be like funky like patterns this is like bef- before this was right. yeah. so I used to deal with some guy out of Ottawa and I'd consign like 500 pairs of boxer shorts and I'd load up my car it's Sunday morning at 5 a.m. and go set up a booth at the flea market all day and make a couple hundred bucks at like 16, 17 and kind of did some of that stuff. So mm-hmm. I, I've had that sort of entrepreneurial spirit. Right. Then when I was in college, I was um, at Centennial studying marketing and um, I, I started promoting nightclubs and uh, it was just more like a fun thing. But uh, like I said, I've never really been sort of sidetracked with stuff and the more I got into it, you know, the more I noticed, like, wow, everyone's calling me now. I'm kind of like the guy. And I was getting paid like 30 bucks a week to hand out flyers and bring people. It was like nothing. Mm-hmm. But I didn't care. I was enjoying what I did. And then one day I just decided to step out of my lane and literally just down the street here in Yorkville, there's uh, there was a club back in the day. I forget the name of it is. It's not there anymore. But anyways. 111? No, it wasn't 111. Mm-hmm. It was 17 Yorkville, which is at the corner of Young and okay. uh, Scorpio. Scorpio. Anyways, um, I said, yeah, I'm going to throw my own party, see what's good. 500 people showed up. 
Mm-hmm. I was wow. like, all right, it's all right. Then I started working for a couple other people, just kind of getting my feet wet, and uh, just through hard work and determination, you know, and getting up at eight o'clock in the morning and flying all the parking lots at my college and at U of T Scarborough campus in York, and just grinding and working hard. Got into the nightclub thing, did really well with it. I uh, ended up being a partner in a, in a venue called Granite Lounge, mm-hmm. and yeah. then um, yeah, man, I just kind of worked my way up, but. The way that evolved into sort of the concerts and stuff is my parties, like I said, there was like 3,000 people Friday, Saturday. The Raptors were coming out. Any celebrities that were in town would come out. Pharrell would come out when he was in town. Like just whoever. It wasn't like the way it is now. There was only really one or two really hot spots and I was sort of running them. And so um, kind of got some opportunities with some corporate sponsors to throw a couple um, concerts. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. It's a little bit different. This is like an evolution of the nightclub thing. And it just spiraled, and I was sort of getting over the nightclub thing. And dude, next thing you know, it was just like I was booking Sean Paul, and I was doing Ludacris, and I was doing all these concerts. And it just, I again, I consumed myself in that world. And you know, there wasn't a Live Nation at the time, and there mm-hmm. wasn't some of these other bigger, you know, publicly traded companies, and there really wasn't a lot of people. Sort of like Toronto was sort of behind. It wasn't like a legit network. That there wasn't a network. Leverage. There was no Drake. There was no There's like. Nothing. There was yeah. no international artist in the hip hop scene who was just bringing that attention to the city. Yeah. So I was the guy. You're truly grinding. There You're was grinding. No, there was no Drake, but there was Wiltshire Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> so fast forward to the the story this guy wants me to tell. Oh, okay. <laughs> is um, so through me doing all these concerts, I'm working with all the record labels and all this kind of stuff, and and so I, what I did is I went to the record labels back in the day and I said, listen. CD sales are going down, so the money that you guys have to spend on marketing these artists is not the same as it used to be, so I'll make you guys a deal. I'll pay the cost to bring these artists into the country that you want to bring around to do radio interviews and all the pro- the promo press tours for two, three days. I said, on one condition, I want to be able to do a concert with these guys at night. So they were like, sounds good. So I get the call. We do this thing. My friend out in New York, Kim Bariano, she was like one of the head girls from Jive or Sony or something. So we bring... Chris Brown, we did a show in Edmonton and Toronto with him, first time ever here, and he was hot. He was blown up at the mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. So we did a show at Republic, and uh, I get this call from some dude, and he's like, yo, man, you got to put my cousin on, you, uh, my, my nephew on, and I'm like, okay. And I'm getting these calls all the time, right? Put, yeah. put my boy on, put my friend on, this, that, the other. Didn't know who this guy was. Right. So the guy sends me an EPK, and uh, as soon as I open it, I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, this is 2007. I'm like, this is wheelchair Jimmy. I'm like, <laughs> he can't rap. What does he know about hip hop? Like wheelchair. Now, who, now let me say, that. EPK. People don't know electronic press kit. Correct. For people to know, it's just essentially a document that you send or some photos, so you would know who the artist was. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. for those that didn't watch the Grassy High, uh, <laughs> wheelchair Jimmy is Drake. Wheelchair shout Jimmy out. is Drake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so it. shout out to Grassy. <laughs> yeah, really. So me just being in my own little bubble, thinking you know I know what's what and what's right and what's wrong and. I was like, oh, hell no, I'm not letting Wheelchair Jimmy open up for Chris Brown. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so I didn't even call his uncle back. Like, I just sort of, like, just dismissed him. And I had a guy that worked for me at the time whose girlfriend was, like, an R&B singer. Mm. She was actually pretty good. Mm-hmm. But um, just on the strength, I was like, yeah, man, we'll get your girl to open up for Chris Brown, who she never made it anywhere. Great girl, good voice, but never made it anywhere. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of, like, just, there was no, there was no, no Drake on the show. But it would have been cool. That story, right? If I had a, had Drake open up for, for Chris Brown. Yeah, at the time especially. I have a bad... Uh, me and Drake are mad cool. We get along. But I have... A, I have a, it's, Our relationship's funny because um, probably six months after that, I had Drake and an artist in Toronto named J.D. Era open up for Pretty Ricky. Mm-hmm. I was doing a charity event for the Nelson Mandela Foundation. And they approached me and they wanted to do something different. So I said, okay, well, Pretty Ricky's the, the hot group right now. Let's do a show and we'll raise funds for you know Nelson Mandela Foundation so I had Drake and and uh, JD Air open up and the show was running late not too late 20 minutes late and Pretty Ricky they were just on their own ego at the time like they were kind of like they thought they were too cool for school and Drake was supposed to go on before them but because the show was running late they didn't want to wait so I had to kick Drake I, I had to push Drake's show off mm-hmm. so he didn't get to perform he was there all night didn't perform Oh man. Okay, 0 for 2. And then 0 for 3, right? Good things happen in threes, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So about a year or two later, somebody just shared this on um, Instagram. I was doing a so I tour managed. I was basically 
the promoter for the clips for 10 years to the point where they were like, we don't even need a tour manager. When we come to Canada, Neil's our guy. He's got it. And I'm still friends with both the brothers to this day. And so we did a show in Toronto. Not a lot of people know this story. This is a really good Drake story. Okay. Um, I did it at Tonic. So I used to run Saturday nights at Tonic. So what I did is I did an early show where they would go on at like 9 o'clock. The show would be over by 10. And then I could convert the club into my, my regular Saturday night party because nobody showed up till after 11 anyways. So I put Drake on the show to open up for the clips, which, you know, now Pusha T and Drake have their big beef. But years ago, Drake was a huge clips fan. In fact, I think he talks about how he purchased something on eBay of theirs, a microphone or something like that. So he was really into the show. So a week before the concert, Drake is at that venue on a Friday night, just partying, just hanging out with his homies. And his ex-manager, like ex-ex-manager before he got really famous, was there. He was one of the promoters. So him and Drake have words. And uh, Drake's not, you know, he's not famous yet. He's like literally within a year of getting famous. Mm -hmm. But they have words. And it turns violent. Like it gets into a brawl. Like Drake and three or four of his dudes against like five or six of those dudes. And it gets nasty. I'm not there. I'm doing whatever. I get a call from the club manager. He's like, you need to come see me right now. I go to the venue. It's like, who's this Drake guy that's opening up on the show next week? I'm like, he's one of my opening acts, man. He goes, well, he's off the show. He's like, he got in a fist fight with our promoters tonight, and I've heard them talking about retaliating next week at the show. At the time, like, Drake wasn't that big in the city, so I was like, all right, cool. Call Drake. I'm like, sorry, bro, you're off the show. So wow. punted him from the show because so, of that happened. So 0 for 3. 0 for 3. <laughs> 0 for 3. Uh, yeah, so it's kind of funny. But, you know, we worked with him once or twice after that. And uh, a couple years ago, he did a radio interview where the radio host brought up my name. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm at home, like, doing something with my kids. And my phone's going off, ringing, texting, call, check, listen to the radio, listen to the station. What the hell's going on? So the radio host brought out my name and just said, you know, Neil Force and I were talking about you. And he was talking about back in the day. And Drake could have buried me, right? He could have been like, yo, I guess a punk, this, that, the other. Mm-hmm. Although we always had a good relationship. It wasn't like I purposely ever punked him. And, uh... He was like, look, man. He goes, I can't hate on Neil, man. Neil Neil never had the gift of foresight. He didn't know what I was going to be coming a couple years down the road, nor did I. So he's like, I got no no ill will. And to this day, if I see Drake, he's very, you know, we're cool. Matt, That's cool. good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, good. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think he's wrong? That Do you have the gift of foresight? No. You know? No, I, you know what? Actually, <laughs> I, I, I do sometimes see opportunity. But to yeah. be honest with you, there was so many artists. I've always believed that there's talented artists in the city. And the problem is I was for a small period in my own mind the man so everybody and the mother was hitting me up to be an artist guys would show up in my office with EPKs and people calling me off the hook so it gasses you up right people right. Think, making you think you're you know you get caught up in your own hype and so um, I, I definitely always thought Drake was talented it's the reason why I wanted him to be on these shows I just didn't obviously know he was going to be at the level he's at now but with regards to foresight I think uh, that sort of helped some of my successes because I started as a nightclub promoter pivoted to doing concerts across Canada. Now I'm pivoted to doing corporate events across North America. Uh, I was also heavily involved with the UFC for years. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, now I'm on to some you know, philanthropy stuff and some art initiatives that I'm doing. So I don't know if it's foresight or me just seeing opportunity, but that's the thing. People always, you know, Toronto, I love this city. Love the, I've been all over North America. I haven't really been outside North America to compare it, but within North America, I think it's the best city. Mm-hmm. And um, it's funny because now that I'm sort of getting into curating art events, right? Um, Toronto's always looked at as behind, right? Like culinary-wise, we're behind Europe. And art-wise, we're behind the rest of the world. And fashion, that's Paris and New York and all these other cities, right? And we sit here and I love it because all it is is for a guy like me, I see opportunity. Exactly. To bring that here and sort of like bring it to the next level. And so I think with... You know, I might be tooting my own horn a bit, but like what I was doing with the nightclubs back in 1998, 99, no one was doing 3,000 people hip hop parties. Mm-hmm. And my my cl- my company back then, the reason I could do 3,000 people was because I'm I'm my mom is Indian from India, mm-hmm. and um, I grew up in Scarborough, so I had a mixed variety of friends. Grew up with black people, Filipino people. So mm-hmm. when I would go to clubs, I'd I'd go to all these different parties, and they were all segregated based on sort of their their ethnicity or the culture, but they were all listening to the same music. It's all hip hop. So from that, I came up with the concept of calling my promotion company Mass Appeal. We appeal to the masses. So what I did is I purposely hired promoters of every ethnicity. And 
our parties were like everything from Filipino, black, white, you name it. It was just an amalgamation of every of what we were in Toronto. Yeah, the true expression of the city. Which enabled me to stay relevant throughout the year because sometimes depending on the time of the year, we would do like a cultural event to sort of highlight Chinese New Year or Diwali. Not to say specifically I did those events, but we would always think of ways, you know, I was tying in with like the Indian Student Associations or the Filipino Student Associations or the Caribbean Student Associations. So our parties would always be busy because of that. Right, because I had a bigger pocket than just going after one lane, right. So I think what I did back in those times, no one was doing that, mm-hmm. right. And it enabled me to do three thousand people Friday and Saturday right. for years, for years. Yeah, and I then think- that and that kind of got you like right into the into the next chapter, which is basically creating the Substance Group. Yeah. So I um, I went to the um, the docks in two thousand and two or three, and I went to the owners and I said, look. I don't know if you guys remember this. A lot of people don't know this, but Rebel, which used to be called the Docks, they used to close down in the summer in the winter. Mm-hmm. So after Labor Day, until I think May long weekend, they would be shut. And so I went to them and I said, "Listen, I think I got something. I want to try every Saturday here." And the owner looked at me. Nobody knows the owner. He's this miserable old uh, dude, Jerry Sprockman. And he looked at me and he goes, "Son, it'll never work. It's not gonna work." It's like a movie. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> he's like old school hardcore Jewish billion dollar like commercial real estate developer who just is angry at the world and just yeah. screw everyone right yeah. so we're in this meeting and I'm like you know I'm a salesman I'm like no I can make it work this is what I do on Fridays I can do this I can do that so he, he looks at me right like a, like a gangster and he goes son he goes we're gonna give it a shot he goes and if it doesn't work don't think you're leaving here in one piece <laughs> I was debating if I should punch him in his face at that moment because I don't like being threatened. But right. at the same time, I'm like, it is what it is, right? right. He's half senile. Yeah. So we did it. And, first. You, and you knew you were going to make it work. We knew we were going to make it yeah. work. So what we did is I got, at the time, Baby U, who I managed for 15 mm-hmm. years and starting from scratch. We got the live to air on flow. We had them doing four turntables every night on the stage. Um, I probably brought six or seven of the top promotional companies to work sort of underneath me in the city within their respective communities. So it wasn't just me. I was sort of the architect behind it. I had my own team of like 20 promoters and then we had probably six or seven teams. I had like 50 guys promoting the night. My payouts were insane. Uh, The first night we had 5,000 people. Wow. And it was just like, it was over. So you you basically left in one piece. (laughs) I left, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Um, No, but we, 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 uh, so from that, I had partnered with a couple other guys that we had similar sort of like, we were just on that level. And so I was like, yo, man, this is kind of fun. Then the concerts, we got approached to do concerts there and all these opportunities started popping up. So the the premise behind that was let's bring together my company, those two companies, and let's do a company that sort of is the umbrella. And those events will be promoted as the substance group. And the purpose of those events were to do events that had more substance to them. So like special events, festivals, concerts, that or that kind of thing. Not nightclubs, deeper sort of meaning. Right. So um, the first tour we did, I got really lucky. I did Sean Paul, um, 2003, back when he blew up. Mm-hmm. Like, bro, we paid that guy nothing. And his manager used to live in Montreal. He was friends with a friend of mine from Montreal who called me. He's like, yo, I got Sean Paul. He's blowing up. He's like, I need to do something with it. Can you help me just put this tour together? I helped him put the tour together in exchange for me doing the Toronto shows, sold out both shows in like two days, made more money than I knew what to do with, bought me a fat 24, 2003, I think, brand new Lincoln Navigator wow. with the bars that dropped. Like no yes. one except Vince Carter had the v- Navigator yeah. at the time. Black on black? <laughs> no, no, it was like a champagne. Cre- the champagne. Champagne. <laughs> champagne. <laughs> Stupidest investment of my life, sold it three <laughs> years later for like, Ten grand, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but I was pimping for a minute. Um, so it's technically not an investment. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not an investment. Yeah. But uh, that sort of got me to the concert sort of scene, and then probably about a year after that, me and one of the groups kind of like we just decided they weren't going to roll with us. And then my other partner, um, him and I lasted like five years, and then just through like most relationships or partnerships, they don't always work out. So mm-hmm. me and him just different people. We were growing up, man. We were like early twenties. You know what I mean? There's a lot of issues when you're in your early 20s. How you are when you're in your 20s versus your 30s, you're, it's different, right? So, mm-hmm. I think so. it's a, it's amazing. It's true of both of you guys that you guys, your greatest commodity is GTD. You just know how to get things done. There's something about like, 
I mean, we, we all of us know people that have great ideas. They're always talking about great ideas about what they want to do or might do or just about to do. And then there's people they don't have time to talk just because they're just doing it. I love that. Yeah. You're right, man. Yeah, I mean that's like your greatest. It's it's amazing to see like that that that's what you have. You know, the the grinding, uh, that effort, that attitude towards things. But we were talking kind of before we started uh, doing the show about how you learn to walk wise, and you, you know through the years. I mean, you've accomplished a lot you know, so far. You have like probably more stories than most. <laughs> like. You know, to have three stories rejecting Drake, I mean, in your pocket, that mo- not most people can say that. Yeah. Now, with that, how do you walk wise now? What's one thing that when you go, because at the core, you're still yourself. You have all that ambition, all that drive, that, that belief. I believe, like, belief molds so many things. Like, you just know it's possible. Yeah. So that next thing that comes along for this city or whatever, like, how, how, do, you, how do you approach it and how do you start to architecture it? Um, um. That's a good question. So my biggest sort of, um, thank you for the kind words, by the way. Mm -hmm. So my biggest asset sometimes is my biggest liability is that I say yes to everything because I see an opportunity with everything. And so sometimes it works. It's a home run, right? And then sometimes it's, it's a strikeout and I'm like, why did I do that? Or why did I commit to that? Or, and it's because I always see an opportunity, you know, like it could be the silliest idea, but sometimes the best ideas come from the silliest sort of ideas. So I'm that guy that thinks like everything's great and I want to do everything. Uh, but to answer your question, what I've done now is I need to understand myself and manage myself better and take a step back and sort of reevaluate everything I do. So when you say like, what do I do to walk wise? I need to look at the opportunity, assess it, see if I can take it on, see if I want to really take it on, see if I'm really passionate about it. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes if there's a great idea that I don't want to pass up but it's not really passionate, what I'll try and do is rather than let that opportunity die, I'll try to connect other people to make that opportunity to live without me. Smart. Right? Um, 15, 20 years ago, I needed to make money off everything. I don't care if it was $100. You had to get your piece. I needed my piece. Yeah. And it was a small way of thinking. Now I don't need to get my piece. I just want to see people prosper. It's amazing because as you connect them, so you're in one way, you're not letting it go because then you're neglectful. In your mind as being an entrepreneur, to be entrepreneurially minded to believe that you can have a garden grow out of concrete, that anything's possible, yeah. if you just walk away from it, it's always going to bug you. Like, oh man, what if or yeah. what could? But if you connect them with someone for their sake, there's, what's amazing about life? One way, if they are fruitful, it's going to come back to you. And it, you're right, a hundred percent. And uh, I, I'm not a, I'm a very giving person, and um, I never want things to seem like it's insincere. So. You're right to that point is a lot of times I'll just do something out of the goodness of my heart with no intent of it coming back to me, right? Which but I guess speaks to your philanthropic work. I think that's what's so cool. You're definitely not one-dimensional. You're definitely someone who, you know, you, you can survive. Like for me, I, I really respect people who can just survive in any circle. It doesn't matter what it is, if it's with the bad boys on the block or yeah. being in the boardroom. Yeah. Okay. With that said, who are sometimes one and the same? Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, yeah. Who might threaten you, you know, with the leaving in one piece, yeah, right? Yeah. You know. Let me ask you: Does uh, the philanthropic work that you do? It's just something that if you were walking down the street, not everyone would think. What, what was the thing that you did? I think it was 2017. You did a, the first job fair. Yeah. Ever for uh, people, people with, with autism. autism. Yeah. Okay, so where did that come from? How did that, how did that come your way? Was this just a... No, so listen, so I've always wanted to do something to give back. But look, I had my kids young. I'm traveling around the, work, the country and sometimes in the U.S. working and you're all caught up in your own hype. I'd always donate money. You know, I, from, for Christmas about 10 or 12 years ago, I, I, for my kids for Christmas, I bought them two foster kids that we still have to this day. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd go to the grocery store and I'd donate, you know, do you want to donate a bag towards Thanksgiving for a family that can't afford, I'd give 20, 30 bucks. I'd always give money, right? Because I didn't have the time to give my time. But I've always had that, you know, I was always grounded to where I wanted to just give in some capacity. Now that I'm in a position with my company where financially and and sort of even infrastructure-wise, I'm at a better place in my life where I'm, you know, I can do things. I started just volunteering and just creating some my own initiatives about three years ago and uh something like dude so it got this is what happened 
companies pay and hire me to think of creative things, right? To do marketing for them. So I was like, how can I use that to do things to bring awareness, maybe even solve a problem for different people that are in need? So a couple of years ago, I created something called 12 Days of Giving, which my company, 12 of my staff, we picked 12 dif- different initiatives in December and we, you know, we uh, donate or we volunteer. And then from that, I uh, one day, it was like three days before um, Christmas, I sent out a tweet and I said, who wants to help me on Christmas Eve decorate a kid's playroom at the YWCA? Mm-hmm. Got $3,000, had 20 friends, we went in. And we totally redecorated on Christmas Eve this kid's playroom. It was really sad because there's like 30 kids that live in this YWCA building downtown here. And they had no toys, no books, no nothing. So gr- grabbed the money, went to like uh, Scholar's Choice, Toys R Us, and we just totally Got redid the books. room. Yeah. Um, and I just felt like, a, like, I was like, yo, this is rewarding. You know, like I couldn't even... Ex- I could make 20 grand one night, I could lose 20 grand, but there was a feeling that I got doing that that was more rewarding. So fast forward a couple months later, I'm seeing these kids on the internet doing this uh, Tim Hortons cup challenge where they're buying 100 Tim Hortons cups and trying to see if they would win something stupid shit, right? So I was like, you know what, I'm going to buy 1,000 cups. I said, and we're going to do a 1,000 cup challenge, but all the cups we win, we're going to donate to the homeless. I don't even care if I win $10,000. If one of those cups gets me 10 Gs, that's going to a homeless yeah. person, right? Yep. So I got a group of people. I went and bought a thousand cups. I actually did a little short video just to document the whole thing. Um, went over to a Tim Hortons that a friend of mine known purchased the cups, and then we kind of had this little fun thing at my office where we actually made a whole wall of the cups, mm-hmm. just make it cool. And then we went on the streets and gave all the cups to the homeless people. Right? They were empty cups. They weren't full. We just bought the cups. And so I was sitting there one day. I'm like, man, I really like this. So myself and a couple other individuals that were helping me out. We're like, we know we want to do more of this kind of stuff. Well, you know, let's let's think of a name. Let's do all this stuff. And so one of the guys in the group was like, you know, I want to do something with autism. I have an autistic son and I, I want to do something. And so now my mind starts racing. And I remember there was the dancing barista that was on Ellen yep. from Starbucks. You know, he's from Toronto. Oh, I didn't know no, that. they're from Toronto. Okay. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Shout out again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right? Um, People from Toronto are doing things all over the world. Akon, Akon told me, he's like, Toronto's like Brooklyn. He goes, no matter where you go in the world, you meet someone from Toronto. Yes. Right? And yeah. it's crazy and I love it. I'm so proud to see because a lot of these people doing those things used to come to my parties, used to work for me, what have you. And I'm so proud of seeing what they're, what yeah, they're up to. You it's know? amazing. Um, but anyway, so my mom was complaining a week before that meeting that she had done a job fair in Scarborough for youth and the youth didn't show up. She's like, oh, did this job for and these kids didn't show up you know blah 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 blah. so my mind started racing and i'm like well there's the dancing barista at starbucks which means autistic people can work i'm like there's a job fair where regular kids don't want to go to because they don't appreciate it i said you know what we're going to do job fair for people with autism amazing and we had three weeks to put it together so uh i got on the call i put out a tweet got all these responses i said anybody you know i didn't know anything about autism uh, and so I put out a tweet saying, yo, anybody that want to help me with this? So I got like a hundred responses on Facebook. Call this guy, call that guy. I want to be involved, this, that, the other. And there was one group called Autism Speaks Canada where I was connected to two or three individuals within that group. And they're the largest sort of non-for-profit charitable arm for autism. They're federally funded. They fund some of the smaller uh, organizations within Canada. And they're, they're a big, they're a big deal. They're over, they're around the world, right? So I reach out to them and I'm telling them about this this idea I have and they're a big organization so they have to proceed with caution and they're kind of like what's well, a cool idea but like how are you going to make it work it's in three weeks who are you what do you know what you don't know anything about autism this that the other <laughs> yeah. and I remember I was driving to Buffalo New York with a friend of mine going to watch the UFC and they, they had me on a conference call and they're just they're just shitting on me not in a, in, in a constructive way yes just like it was all negative though, right? It was kind of like, how are you going to make it happen? You've never done a job fair. And I just... The voices I, of reason. Yeah, 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 definitely the voices of yeah. reason. But, uh, you know, I'm a maniac. So I was just like, look, you guys are putting up all these barriers as to issues that could happen, but you've never asked me about what, who I am and what I can do. So long story short is we produced the event. We had media coverage from across Canada. We had 150 people show up. We had some of the biggest employers in Canada... Um, we had politicians show up. Then we f- did it a year after that. We moved it downtown to Metro Hall. We got one of the lead stories on CTV National News. We had 20 million media impressions. It was massive. 
Apple calls me. Apple's like, we saw what you're doing. We want to work with you. Um, so I'm proud that we're doing year three, which is April 8th this year, but we're doing it in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal Amazing. Wow. on the same day. And we're now calling that Autism Employment Day. And uh, I've locked in everybody from Apple, all five major banks, Shoppers Drug Mart, Loblaws, Purolator, um, basically all Fortune 500 sort of companies. Like the level of employers we've gotten secured, people are looking at me that are in sort of the job fair industry and they're like, how did you get these That's companies? Yeah. Amazing. We've never seen this list. What's the exact date you have for that? April 8th. Monday, April 8th. April 8th. I'm in. Right. Yeah. You in? Yeah. Monday, Are you in? Are you in? Yeah. Yeah. That's oh, awesome. It's in the afternoon. See you after this. You guys yeah. have, uh, I mean, as a substance group, you guys have produced some really cool events that we've done some work with you guys on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and to see what you guys are doing, I mean, it's very cool. I mean, obviously, uh, the, the most recent one we saw was uh, the TIFF. Yeah. Right? Um, what, what sets you guys apart from, like, you know, other event producers i mean what gives you that special that special uh, touch to make things uh, you know kicked up yeah you know, that's a good question so the industry that we're in right now people people like to put labels right and labels are so like confining you know what i mean it's kind of like so when i got out of the entertainment industry and started to focus more with on corporate clients and corporate opportunities you know, everyone said, okay, you're an agency. You're an experiential agency. So I went with that narrative. I'm like, okay, I'm an agency. I'm an experiential agency. Um, but I'm a guy that I always like to do things a little bit differently. Like I don't like to look at things from inside the box. So I think the reason why, excuse me, we had success with the autism thing is uh, people within the autism community were like, who are you? Where'd you come up with this idea? Like, <laughs> how'd you this? get this done? But I'm a guy on the outside looking in. I think sometimes exactly. you're so boxed in yeah. that you need the best ideas or some come from the outside yeah. right so i'm here learning remember i told you like i just consume everything so i'm learning about this agency world i didn't even know what experiential was i just said okay i'm an experiential agency i didn't know all these terminologies like rfps and aos's and this that the other i didn't know any of that stuff but i immersed myself in that in the last couple of years and through a lot of error got to understand you know a lot of things within that industry um a mentor of mine who used to be high up at one of the uh, VPs one of the, at the bigger agencies kind of looked at me one day and he goes do you know what your value proposition is what the hell are you talking about <laughs> yeah right yeah he goes your value proposition so he explains to me what that is and he goes I don't know anybody that has a deeper Rolodex than you he goes you have connects that companies and agencies like mine would pay you for those contacts mm -hmm. so it really helped me define my company and that our sort of differentiator is my network Everyone's got a network, right? Everyone's got contacts. Um, but uh, there's a certain level of like relationships, I guess, that I've had over the last 20 years that I'm able to bring now to my clients and say, listen, like I can do this. I can get this done. Or I know this guy. I can do this. And it's afforded us the ability to work with some of the biggest companies in the world right Amazing. now. Amazing. And the other thing that I do is I don't hire people um, that come from like an agency experience. I don't really care. Like... You know, I look at their work ethic, I look at their willingness to learn, I look at their ambition, I look at other things, right? Because um, some of the people that I've hired, and I've hired a lot of people over the last two, three years that I've had to let go, have had four or five or six years experience in this industry, and they're terrible. Or they're so caught doing this one thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, nah, it's not going to work for me. So I, I just look at the individual. You know, you get a really good person. They can learn to adapt. They can learn spreadsheets. They can learn yes. these different things. So the one thing I'm very proud of is I have an amazing team. Like you got, you guys know this better than anybody. You yeah. got to staff yourself with a good army. Oh yeah. Right. And you got to surround yourself with people that are, if not as good as you, better than you. Absolutely. And I'm not afraid to admit that I got a team of young savages, and they're so talented. And we're quick to knock millennials, and I'm the first to knock millennials. But there's a lot of good millennials out there, and yep. I've managed to sort of surround myself with a good sort of level of people that are just they're incredible. And because of them, year over year, we're just it's just blown up. I, I mean, let's we, get we, that on record. Yeah. This just well, we've defined it now that there are some good millennials out there. There are. I mean, are. We, we should be knocking the millennials' parents. Okay. Yeah, I, I, did you see that thing? The dude who actually, Simon Sinek, he's the one that actually talked about the millennials. That, yeah, yeah, and yeah. he goes, "You should knock the parents." I right. don't, I don't disagree. No, for sure. I mean, you know, one of the things about you, man, like I love your energy. I, I mean, you, you, like if I close my eyes right now and you start talking, I'm gonna. 
I mean, you've heard this before. We've actually said this. People, you sound like Gary Vee, man. I get that all the time. Yeah. In fact, for six months, but I didn't even know who the hell Gary Vee was. People were calling <laughs> me going, bro, you're like Gary Vee. Finally, people sent me links. And now, dude, I'm, I get it at least once a month. Yeah, and you have that. You have that flow. I guess. I, I guess mean, it's, it's, a just, Gar- it's a relatable energy, too, because, I mean, Gary Vee's person of conviction. Yeah. You know? I, I have to thank him because up until Gary Vee kind of blew up, people just thought I was a-hole. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. I get that all the time, right? Yeah. But I mean, to those He's days, legitimized though, your swag a little. He's, yeah. he's legitimized yeah. being just, you know what, being brash. Yeah. You know, I had a guy that called me the other day, a good friend of mine, and he was like, can you mentor me? And I'm like, what? Wow. He goes, he goes I like the way you just come at things raw and honest. Yeah. He says, people don't want to be uh, told the truth. He said, I'm not afraid to let my ego you know, uh, get a kick sometimes. That's good. So I was talking with my wife with last week. We say it on the regular. You know how you just you have interactions with people and you learn from them. You learn maybe to stay away or to maybe get a little more of that. And we're always constantly this inventory of life. We're trying to, I need more of this, I need less of that. And there's one thing that we, we both agree on. We love honest people. We just love honest people. And that if they're honest, you know, you get an idea of the heart of that person by what they say. And if they're honest, you just know that, that you know they'll be honest with you. They have they're always flawed. Okay, honest people are always flawed because they're honest with themselves. And there's just something so amazing because you could trust it. Like there's something about when someone is just perfect and they're polished and they have everything ready to say, and uh, you can never see a flaw or hole in it. I've learned that there's a reason why there's such a strong emphasis to postulate that way because there's there's probably some baggage or things there that sure. they're, there's there's stuff in the closet guaranteed i i agree with you i mean look you know we always think like i'm just gonna lie my way out of this or that and you learn from time to time when you're younger like that's not the way because oh, you yeah. end up getting caught yes what have you it's not that you're a bad person but you just don't know how to handle the situation um one of the things that i tell my 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 staff one of the things that i'm very sort of um I, I beat into people is look accountability right it's like take accountability for the decisions or your actions and we'll work together to fix it but if you don't take accountability we got a problem mm-hmm. right and um look in the industry that i'm in we're the client um you know we're, we're always provi- sorry we're always providing for the client and it's very rare the client's going to take accountability for something so sometimes we have to take it on the chin but i tell my staff i'm like look i make bad decisions all the time i make wrong decisions all the time i'm no different or better than anybody else but it's the way you handle that yes right and more times than not you have to take accountability yeah. for your actions and the goal isn't perfection no yeah it's, then we, you're going to be struggling we yes. have we have actually we've mentioned this in the past um i mean the the I like to call it the the eight mile strategy. Now, have you seen Eight Mile? Years ago, I have to see it again. Okay, so. I mean, let's just go jump right right to the end. He does the that rap battle, and and they're just kind of trying to take each other out for the rap battle, like and, this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't do that. Okay, um, <laughs> another show. But basically, uh, you know, it, it doesn't come to the part where Eminem actually starts rapping about himself. And taking, like, you know, he, he basically starts giving, taking away the other rappers' ammunition, right? About who he is. He, he's someone that is, you know, uh, you know beneath him. And, and, and he had, comes up from a poor upbringing and all. And the bottom line is the, the guy couldn't continue because yeah. he, he disarmed him. And, and that's just taking accountability almost in the sense of if you, if you come into a situation and you acknowledge something, right? At the end of the day, you're going to take away from someone else. And you're going to lead that, that, uh, that path very differently, than what it was might have gone to if you just don't take that accountability. Sure. I guess it's, just, it's owning who you are. Yeah, so if you right. own who you are, if you're late, everyone knows you're late. You come in late and you walk in and you just give that awkward smile. Like, right? You know you're supposed to come in. Yeah. How, about, how about you say sorry? I'm late. Sorry, I'm late. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. It's oh, funny. Oh man, I hate I hate excuses. I mean, to me, it's just like if you know how quickly you can end this conversation. I'm sorry, I'm late. Uh, you know, yeah, there's traffic. I mean, because as soon as you say that, let me like go leave earlier, right? I mean, just, yeah, uh, yeah. it's one of those things. But yeah, I'm late, but they got like a nice fresh coffee. Oh, in that's the worst. <laughs> yeah, dude. yeah. Well, you had time to get coffee, right, hey, dude? Don't even get me started. I hate that. <laughs> I hate that. I mean, it's 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 irritating. Let me ask you this, uh, Neil. You, you've actually met a lot of a lot of people of influence. I mean, we've gone over some cool stories, and I know there's a lot more. <laughs> um, recently, It'll I was be watching in my book one day. No, yeah. I know. Oh yeah. Um, and some of the notes that were thrown at me recently. Uh, I mean, I was just was it last week? Joe Rogan did a podcast on Mike Tyson. Okay? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, now I, I know one of the things that you've actually met Mike Tyson. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I, I know also uh, Jerry. 
he was actually on an event uh, with uh, with uh, Mike Tyson. That's Jerry right there, Jerry the intern. He took one of these nice photos here. This is actually an event in Toronto um, of, of Mike Tyson with <laughs> the Trailer Park Boys. That so one of the guys that works in my office is on the Trailer Park Boys. Oh my god! Oh really? He's one of the big characters. Who? Oh, Sam. Sam. Sam, Sam that's Sam right. Wesco. Yeah. Does he use that same uh, that same name on, on? No, his real name is Sam. No, but on, the, on Trailer Park, what was his name? His name on Trailer Park Boys is the Greasy Caveman. Okay, right? okay. Sam Wasco. Oh, yes. Okay. He's the Greasy Caveman slash the veterinarian. That's right. I remember I saw him yeah. at your office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but his real name is Sammy. Yeah. Jerry, do we have permission to put this photo up? Absolutely. That's why I sent it. Okay, that's incredible. That's a picture, man. I mean, who's that character again? The guy that was always <laughs> without a shirt? Lady. Oh, Randy. 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 Randy that's yeah. it. Oh my God. He passed away. No, no way. Really? I had no idea. Yeah, Mr. Leahy passed away like a year ago. Oh, Leahy. Mr. Leahy. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Leahy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was Randy's uh, right. boss. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's a show that, uh, I mean, paid major homage to Canadian culture. You know what I mean? Uh, what show? Was, this was the Tyson show where at the Air Canada Center? Where was no, that? No, 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 no. This was uh, at a uh, music studio out in the Six Stations Indian Reserve. Where in? Uh, uh, Jukasa. Yeah, those are my guys. Kenny Hill and... Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I know, know Kenny, yeah, yeah. I brought... Okay, you want a funny? You want a good story? Yeah, let's go, right, man. Nice. Let's go. <laughs> go for it. So he's a um, nice guy, by the way. I love that guy. Who Kenny? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, Jukasa. Yeah. So um, I get a call from a guy I know in Niagara Falls. This is about seven, eight years ago, and he's like, "Hey, man, um, you know these guys just opened up a studio. They need to bring a celebrity through. Blah blah blah. MMVAs are here. Can you get someone?" So I go, "Okay." So we go through the list. He goes, "Can you get Snoop Dogg?" I go, "Yeah, I can get Snoop Dogg." So I'd work, I've been working with Snoop Dogg for 15, 16 years. So I messaged Snoop's manager, Ted, and I go, yo, man, listen, like, what's it going to cost to get you to go to this sort of like remote sort of like location <laughs> an hour and change outside of Toronto uh, <laughs> on some native reserve, right? And uh, he's like, well, what's it for? And I go, dude, straight up, just some very wealthy native guy who just opened up uh, um, a studio for his son and, you know, and... Uh, they go, okay, well, let's take a look. So ironically, after Toronto, they were doing a show in London, Ontario. So it really wasn't too far out of the yeah. way to get to Caledonia, right? Yeah. So he's like, you know, I can't remember, 25, 30 grand, something like that, right? He goes, give us, you know, this much money. And I go, okay. So as he's, we're going back and forth, uh, I get an email from my guy, uh, Darren, at the t- uh, Darren's his name, he's friends with them, and he goes, Tell them we'll pick them up in any of these cars. And he gives me the list of car inventory, which honestly, if anyone ever saw that, they'd believe it. They think it was his BS. His garage is amazing. There's not a car on his lot that's under 50000 yeah. but most of them are under over 100000 Wow. Like when I say under 50000 there's maybe three or four that are 60, yeah. 70 grand. But these, like, this guy's got two or three Bentleys, two or three Rolls Royce. Just insane amount of cars. Don't forget the Lamborghinis. Oh, <laughs> how many? Like, it's, yeah, I know. He's it's, got like 30, 40 cars. Oh, yeah. Wow. Uh, am, am I lying? We need to no, know. no. He's, he's got, like, during that party, he had all his cars parked yeah. around the property. Yeah. So it was it was nuts. And then he flew in a helicopter just for Just for know, fun. Just for fun. We should do an on-location shoot there one day. Oh, That'd be cool. Yeah. He brought in Matt yeah. Sorum as well. Billy Gibbons from yeah. ZZ Top. I mean, uh, Little Webster was there. And it was just a just, crazy... Yeah. It was a grand opening, and I got hired to... To photograph it because I just well that's kind of what I do. When you say Little Webster, is that like a band or, or actually Webster from the eighties? Webster from the eighties, <laughs> Emmanuel C. Lewis. Right? Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then they have the the board from Abbey Road. Yes, exactly. In the studio. The studio is beautiful. beautiful. Wow, it's insane. It'd be cool to bring a bunch of teenagers that you know don't don't come from the best of neighborhoods. Maybe bring them up there that just it's, love cars that want to work with cars. It's an interesting dynamic. Oh, it, it, that you, sorry, Mike? Just, hold it, on, it's just my mom. Okay, <laughs> it's it's a uh, it's an interesting uh, situation out there because you kind of go and all of a sudden, boom! Yeah, there's this guy's uh, his studio on the left hand side of the street, and then across the street's one of his houses. Yeah, but yeah. Anyways, long story short is I brought Snoop Dogg down, and then they're like, "Can you get a bunch of girls?" So I call a guy I know, and he lines up like thirty of the hottest sort of girls. They send two uh, limo buses down uh, to pick up these girls, drive out to Caledonia, and it's like a scene out of like. Uh, like a, a video, like yeah, 30 still girls Dre, and, still Dre's video with the cars, c- cars and women and wow, it was hilarious. But yeah, I so I brought Snoop Dogg down and Snoop ended up hanging out for a couple hours, and then uh, I think they got to see the wealth. I mean, you could tell right away. So the manager, who's always the uh, opportunist in the most positive way, was like, "Hey, we got to connect." 
So they ended up doing like a deal where they, I think they did, he has like rolling papers. I think right. Snoop has rolling papers. Yes. So that's them. Mm-hmm. So they started a relationship. And I don't know if you know this, but you know that Kenny's behind, uh, he funded um, Trailer Park Boys. That at, I didn't know. At the end. So after they were off ah, TV, the they connect. went on SwearNet. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think he was the one to put up the money for SwearNet. And do you know that he now is you know, part owner of Jocasta Motor Speedway? Who it used to be a Cayuga. Cayuga, which is, uh, I know the guy that, so yeah. the guys that own Cayuga. Used to. Glenn. I don't know if you know Glenn. Glenn Styers. Glenn yeah, I know and, Glenn. Yeah. No, that's us, that's us Weekend Speedway. So, I'm sorry, you're right. Yeah. I'm confused. That's I know right. Glenn, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, but now, but Juca- but Kenny bought Cayuga Speedway, but, okay, okay. the old one, and, and they refurbished it. It's a brand new, beautiful track. <laughs> Uh, him and, and I can't remember the other ch- chap's name, but again, it's like Kenny's just amazing. He just buys up and he puts money into it and tries to make things work for the community. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Now, let me, let me ask you this. How do you balance what you do and balance your life, your family life and all? How, how, like, you know, I mean, obviously what you're doing is not something that it's a nine to five thing. I mean, you're, you're working all, all over the place. I mean, we're kind of in that same line of work where we're getting requests all over the place. How do you, how do you balance everything? <laughs> Ah, uh, you just do. I mean, exactly. I, somebody said this a long time ago. It's like you'll have enough time to sleep when you're dead. So I mean, I hate that saying. Do you <laughs> sleep when you're? Somebody says it all the time. Shane, he goes, I, I go, I'll sleep when I'm dead. You know what I mean? Like yeah, literally. Well, you know what I mean. Listen, our time. I don't want to say it's limited, but you know what? It's just kind of like. I don't know. I I don't know how to explain it. I just wake up and I just figure out a way to do it. You know, like this weekend I spent, you know, time with my kids downtown and then got up couple hours early on sunday did some work you just try to figure out and schedule and and sort of balance everything i mean it's not easy Mm -hmm. um and sometimes you know one sort of gets you know sometimes i don't spend enough time with my kids or i neglect work but i always tell people like the key to success in life i think is balance right Right. yeah i think that's really sort of the key we all fight for this like work could go great and then you don't see your family and then work family's going great and then work suffering or whatever the situation is right or you don't see your friends or you haven't seen your mom for a while or whatever the situation is so you try to balance that i mean you just got to pay attention to both right if you pay attention to both then you can balance it it. and also having an understanding uh spouse or significant other right yeah yeah for sure yeah that can help i um shout out to the understanding spouses (laughs) okay (laughs) and even to the ones that aren't understanding yeah yeah we understand (laughs) we understand you don't understand (laughs) right um but uh no man listen you, you just i approach everything the way i do in life is just like you know you got to give your all and sort of to everybody right uh so i mean it's it's tough it's definitely tough but no it's good I, and i would equate it to we talked about this before it's like working out energy expend you know you can't reserve energy the guy who sits on the couch for 100 days straight he's not going to be 100 times stronger than the guy who moved his body same as with, I, I think of it in the same with getting things done. It, there's an energizing element, even if it's just like washing the one dish for you to get to the hundredth. And it's like it starts to culminate and it starts to build. So once you get that little task done, then there's the next thing that you want to get done. And then I think the key is just knowing when do you take a break, when do you stop. But you're on that like that cycle of being productive. Well, the other thing too, sorry to cut you off, but before I forget my thought. Yeah, absolutely. But I think you'll agree with me is, you know, technology and society, it's all about how do we make our lives easier, right? But it's like, no, it's making us lazier. So when I park at the mall, I'll park, I don't mind parking an extra 50 feet or 100 feet away. It gives me more steps to walk. Mm-hmm. You know, it's extra energy. You know, mm-hmm. just doing those five or six things a day that you could take the shortcut or you could just spend an extra minute, mm-hmm. right, to get to get it in. So, you know, all this technology is supposed to make our lives easier and, and sort of uh, supposed to simplify things. But it's kind of like, what's wrong with doing it the old-fashioned way? We're getting up and doing it and just yeah. moving. My mom's 72, and she she looks and acts like she's 42. Amazing. Uh, energy. Like, I was with her on Saturday, on the phone constantly. <laughs> oh, uh, you know, she, she does uh, charity work, and she volunteers, but... And she gets right into it. She's like, yeah, yeah. Okay, I got to go. My, my other line, my other line. Yeah, hey, yeah. No, right. I'm with my son. That's amazing. But you know what? Yeah. It keeps you young, right? Yes. It keeps you do. Going, right? Yes, because you know? if you stop, right? If you say, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? Yeah. 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 Now, you also, uh, I mean, you also own an MMA gym. I do. 
I mean, yeah. uh, it's funny because uh, last week, uh, you know, we were interviewing also someone that I believe you may know. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. My nemesis. Yeah, yeah, yeah Joel Gerson. Oh, yeah. No, oh. no, no. We're, oh, we're, we got to fight. Jerry, can you line that up? Absolutely. We, yeah. Sounds good. Wait. So episode two fights episode three. And maybe let's just do that as a continual thing on the show. You always have, we'll see who's I, king of standing in the six. Listen, listen. Right? <laughs> Joel's a much more experienced and accomplished uh, fighter than I am, but I, I would take that dance just for the test. Oh. oh. Ooh, look at that let's do let's okay, cook it up uh, yeah um yeah joel and i go back we have a very interesting uh, relationship but we are in a very good place and we get along really well and we're good friends now okay nice you say um, you say now because now. Well, was there something that you know yeah i think it would be interesting to sort of speak to joel about this in an open dialogue like this because i think he'd agree with me but and you know through joel and i getting to know each other over the last 10 years that i've had my gym I've understood where he came from. So Joel and I didn't know each other. He comes from the grappling world. I came from the Muay Thai world. I fought in Muay Thai. He fought very uh, successfully in in, uh, in grappling and jiu-jitsu. Mm. Um, so when I open my gym, I I don't look, you know, I don't care who's doing what. I've, I don't really pay attention to others. I immerse myself in what I do to get an understanding of what I'm doing, but I don't care what the guy across the street does yeah. versus the guy down the road does I'm just going to do me and I'm going to do it ethically and I'm not going to try and screw people over and I'm just going to do things right so when I'm opening my gym you know word gets out so he walks in my gym as we're building it like two weeks before we open he's a cocky little guy walking in he goes this is your gym this is your gym I go yeah he goes hmm he goes and who are these guys I go they're my partners he goes it's not going to work you guys are going to fail it's not going to work says it doesn't give a crap says it and I'm like I slapped this guy in a second, right? So he's like, huh, well, these are your mats? I go, yeah, these are my mats. He goes, ah, they're, they're okay. Right? I'm like, who, who, who is this guy? I didn't yeah. even invite him. So he leaves and we go about our business. He does his thing. And we had success very early on. I, uh, I was fortunate to have a partner who's just, I've been training martial arts for 30 years and mm-hmm. I've trained different forms of martial arts. And my, one of my partners is just like the best trainer I've ever seen um, to this day. And so, by having him sort of be there as sort of the face and the name behind the gym and I was the marketing guy so the day we opened I had a thousand people at the gym lined up it was like a nightclub yeah. I had UFC fighters I had the community m and Meats and Maple Leaf Farms and I had supplement co- I just Z103 doing radio ads and all this stuff we had a thousand people we had signed up like 100, 200 people that day um, so we were like the talk of the town and we we knew how to market online and just well I knew how to do that stuff so as time kind of went on, we had success right away. We were very, very lucky. Um, and so Joel was sort of being a little bit petty and doing what he does. And I just kind of ignored it. And then I guess sort of the the, the coming to God moment was one day, I was telling you this the other day, Joel and I have a mutual friend and uh, she has a private jet. And so she had invited us out uh, to go away with her for the week, her and a group of other friends for the weekend to go see Kiss perform out in North Carolina. Wow, that's an experience. Yeah, it was kind of cool. Wow. And she, she is a business with Gene Simmons. So um, Joel had posted on social media, going to hang out with Kiss for the weekend, in some, you know, something like that. So as a joke, just because I, I said, see you there. So I didn't think he, he thought like, ah, what's he talking about? So I get to the airport hangar. I'm the first guy there. And to the pick, second... Because you want to pick your seat? No, 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 I no, just, I'm just joking. <laughs> I just had, it's funny, I just happened to be there because it was close to my house. So Joel walks in. He's the second guy there. It's like God was going to mess with us that day. So Joel walks in with his glass, with his shades on, right? His cool guy, like, you know, metrosexual Joel. And I'm sitting there on the couch and I see him before he sees me and I'm loving this, right? And he just looks at me and he goes, what are you doing here? I go, I told you I'd see you here. Yeah. So uh, we, we spent the weekend together, but we, I think we, our sort of guard was down more on his end than mine. And uh, we, we just got to talking and he was like, and he goes, I got to admit, he goes, so many gyms come by and they close. It's like security companies, right? So many come yeah. and go. Uh, so many guys try to do things unethically like poach your guys or just do shady things or undercut you or what have you. And he had experienced a lot of that. He also came from, uh, he had some people above him that he came from a lineage and I think they did him wrong as well. So he, he had to have his guard up and he had to be very careful about who he liked and trusted and I know he's had some issues with some of his trainers as well who have sort of left and tried to like steal his students. So it's a very, it's a, it's a dirty business like any other business. Like any business. Yeah. So I think he kind of treated us the same way. Like, who are these guys opening a gym down the street for me? 
what are they going to do? Like kind of all these things. And But after we got to talking and spend the weekend together, like we had a lot in common. And I think he saw my values that like, look, dude, I never went to your gym and flyered. I never did anything sort of yeah. unethical in the last three, four years we've been open. Like, And so from that, we became friends to the point where the story is always going to stick out of my mind is, and I think Joel's misunderstood because he's an extremely successful guy with his gyms. Yes. I have the utmost respect for what he's built. It's a tough industry, but... I know a lot of what he's done in terms of building it, and that's his baby. Like, my gym was my side vanity project, so for him, it's this is his baby, so I understand he's got to protect his his interests, right? So I never was really offended at what, you know, he would do or say or just, you know. But um, one day, uh, he was looking for a jiu-jitsu coach, and I was fortunate to have sort of one of the top trainers at my gym at the time, a guy named Rob DiCenzo. They call him Spidey, mm-hmm. world-class jiu-jitsu guy. And uh, Spidey was my guy. So I said, listen, I said, uh, Joel, if you need a guy for a couple of days a week to teach classes, you can take Spidey. I'll, I'll give him a shout. I'll talk to him. He's like, really? You'd let him train? You'd let him teach here? And I said, yeah, why not? He goes, you would do that? Why would you do that? I'm like, bro, we got to help each other out, man. We're a community at the end of the day. Yeah. I'm like, if people are going to leave my gym because he's teaching two or three classes a week at your gym, I don't want them in my gym. I'm like, he's still going to teach here. So as long as you can promise me you're not going to conflict with my class schedule you could have spidey so i called spidey and you know like i said joel's a good guy i think he's just misunderstood in the beginning spidey was kind of like i don't know i've heard bad things about the guy i heard he's difficult and i'm like look like if he was difficult why would i be telling you to go yeah you know work there so i don't know anyone who's driven is difficult yeah Yeah, that's it man like i have a lot of respect for joel i mean we we get along really well we talk from time to time that's awesome i I mean what's so cool about what you're saying um about industries merging. I mean, in our industry, in the security industry, uh, I always, I've always been a big advocate saying, if only companies can get together and work together, then stab each other in the back, right? Yes. I mean, because you can do so much good with you know the greater resource, right? Uh, opposed to just saying, I'm going to try to take a market on its own. So that's amazing, man. I'm, I'm really happy that you know you guys have uh, you know just really you know fostered this incredible relationship yeah. right now. Because you you, know? you weaken the industry when you do that. When it's all, all about your small piece, you actually weaken the industry, the entire image of it, the stigma remains, and you're just like all the other guys, and that's how it is. I think there's something you said off the top about you're just focused on what you do. I think there's a key to success there about just owning your lane. You're in your lane. I always liken it to sport. You're running your race. The best sprinters in the world don't look to the left or to the right. They couldn't care less, okay? And they own their lane. What's, what's cool about your story with Joel, it's like, all those 80s and 90s movies of those two competing foes that actually become the camaraderie builds yeah. and they realize what could we do together yeah that's you know? right yeah you know yeah, what I mean we've never and you know what we've never had an actual conflict yeah I think jokingly and sort of somewhat seriously like I think any conflict was sort of manufactured by him just not just because I think he had been screwed over by others or taken advantage of so he had to be Careful. Guards up. But it's like top of the hill, top of the hill. When you meet each other, if, you, if you're really about something bigger than yourself, then you're like, hey, we can reach the mountain together. And we've proven now 10 years. My gym's been open. His has been open longer, but we've coexisted. That's yeah. amazing. And I think he's open. The gym that I open, which is like a kilometer from his, which mm-hmm. was there was no intent to impinge on his territory by any means, but it was just a good location. It was great opportunity. I couldn't pass up. Yep. In fact, I didn't want to open that gym there. But I was like, it's too good of an opportunity. The rent was really cheap. The location was incredible. Mm-hmm. I was just like, okay, I'll do it. Because it was not convenient for me to where we opened the gym based on where I live and where I work. It was at the other end of the city. Uh, but it was too good of a business opportunity. Um, but, I mean, it was a kilometer from his gym. So I think he was a little bit un- not happy with that. But I came from, what he needs to understand is I came from a world in nightclubs where Every nightclub is next to me on Richmond Street or Adelaide. Yes, close right. proximity. So is, you, know, you know that's the name of the game. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a McDonald's across from a Burger King, across from a Harvey's. Like you just figure it out and make yeah. it work. There's enough people to go around. I don't want to speak on behalf of him, but when he was on the episode, he did share that dynamic of you need to find the right teacher because we were asking if someone, if a kid was getting bullied and they needed to, and he said that's a large amount, a large percentage of new students. That's the dynamic they're being bullied. So he said two things. It's better that they, you know, they learn and they get that composure and confidence before anything happens. But if they do come, he said that you need to find the right teacher. And that might mean that you have to go to a location way farther. And I think even in that, 
there's something in knowing that that if you really stick and put your creative energy into what you do it will be recognized it will stand out and the right type of students that, or families or clients that believe what you believe they're going to come to you it doesn't matter how close it is you know what i mean if i like a better coffee if i really care about coffee i'm going to go to hot black coffee and see jimson's place shout out to jimson episode one <laughs> guest um but yeah i mean you go to what you want you know you'll find a way so and with joel i mean i i, I relate to him a lot I, I get where he came from i know his stories of how he was screwed over by his superiors if that's what you want to call them and even people that work for him so i know what he's had to go through i've gone through the same things in other businesses so i was never offended at his and how he was i mean we only succeed because we fail right and that's the reality dude, i just said it last night yeah. no yeah. dude we i think you learn more from your failures than you yeah. do from your successes and uh it's the way you learn right for sure how do we find you how do we find the substance group uh if if i'm a if i'm a brand I, how does it work who do i have to be to find the substance group yeah, in this mystical world of marketing. Yes, okay. yes. You know, Tell every, us marketing. Everyone's a marketer. Yeah, yeah, yes. I know. Well, I'm very fortunate in that um, 98% of our business is either referral or direct relationships. I'm very fortunate in that. We've taken on three or four clients already this year, and it was through direct relationships of people I knew who are in a position now where they're like, hey, man, oh, you're doing this? Or, hey, I want to work with you on this. We've been very fortunate, and I've taken a bit of a different approach. Um, a lot of agencies have again a lot of agencies have their way of running their business and you know um i'm kind of taking a bit of a different approach um i'm not really interested in sort of going after specific industries or clients that most brands are um one thing i've learned giving away my secrets now (laughs) but i've been very fortunate that i've been involved in the music industry which sort of transcends into fashion and film and i've been around a lot of celebrities and you guys have too um the more uh the more sexy an industry appears to the general public usually the 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 worse it is behind the scenes yeah if you look at the most uh boring industries they have the most money Mm -hmm. right real estate Mm -hmm. technology pharmaceuticals medical there's money there right right um not sexy right um i'm not interested in sexy I've been around sexy a lot the last 15, 20 years. So what I'm trying to do is just take my opportunity with my relationships with sexy Mm -hmm. and take the ones, the opportunities where there's money and I'm going to bring sexy over to the money. Yeah. Bring Bring it in. Bring a little life. (laughs) Bring a little life into that. When I was like 22, I had a chance to possibly buy a coin laundry place at Jane and Finch. Yeah. And I remember talking with my dad and I'm like saying, look, I could buy this. I knew it through my accountant. He let me know. Long story how I even knew him. It's not that I had an accountant at 22. <laughs> Anyways, I would go to my dad and said, Dad, look, one day I'm going to get a mortgage. Help me get a, a business loan or loan it to me so that I can get this coin laundry place. This is what it profits. It's all cash. And I remember and my dad, my dad's a wonderful Filipino man. And he looked at me and he said, it's not sexy. <laughs> okay. And that's what he said to me. He goes, yeah. you're going to say that you own a coin laundry place? He's like, it's nothing to be proud of. Okay, so <laughs> what accent is that? That was no, that was yeah. Filipino to the bone. Hey, oh, nice! Wow, yeah, oh, that was yeah. big. Yeah, it's Filipino. There's there's a large Filipino community in Toronto. Okay. Pil- Pil- yeah. Filipinos, <laughs> <laughs> shout out. So yeah, there's an element of that that yeah. my dad even knows. So okay, I mean, people get caught up in sexy, right? Sexy's not always. Co- it's like I don't know. We want to get into these analogies, but it's like yeah. the hottest girl is probably not the best wife. You know what I mean? Don't get caught up in on the exterior. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, there's more. The substance. Hence, substance. the substance, the substance group. group. It's okay. true. Do, do you want to throw a shout out at the substance group and the, how, how they can find you guys? Uh, yeah, website sure. Website and all? Website is thesubstancegroup.com and all of our social media handles on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook is subs, at substance group. Okay. Nice. 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 And, and just one last question. 2019, what are you, anything you're working on at all that you know, want to... Yeah, man. I'm just trying to take things up a notch. I want to sort of... Uh, the last three years with this marketing agency that we've pivoted from entertainment, it's been getting bigger and bigger. So just trying to blow that up to make it even bigger. Um, I'm investing more time to curating art events. I did a few events last year that were very successful. So Mm -hmm. I want to focus on a little bit of that. I think the city's ready for some sort of, uh, some of that visual stimulation and uh, just trying to really do a lot more with the philanthropy stuff. And I really want to put a lot of attention towards mental health. That's something that personally, uh, not me personally, but I have a 
personal connection to that through some family members. Mm-hmm. So I really want to sort of dedicate a lot of my energy. And um, I see myself just because we've been talking about sort of just where I've been in evolution. I think in like four to five years, I'd like to see myself, my life being dedicated to like philanthropy. I can sort of see myself exiting what I'm doing now because I'll be at that eight year gap where I'm tired of it. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm I'm loving this philanthropy work. It's very rewarding yeah. and I really enjoy it. And that's true the, to the heart of a fighter. It's a fight bigger than yourself, but you're going to keep fighting. That's yeah. like, yeah, you know, it gets you in fist fights for people who owe you money across Canada. Yeah. And then eventually you start fighting for people that can't, it, you know. Very good analogy. I like yeah. that. I'm going to steal that. Hey, Beautiful. sounds good. Beautiful. So we're going to be there in April, or I'm going to be there. Are you going to come? Perfect. I think I will. Okay, man. I think you should be accountable I and come. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate you twisting his arm because yeah. it seems like he's oh, non-committal yeah. right now, right? No, it's we're gonna good. He's a strategist. You. He knows. I got to do more <laughs> research. <laughs> yeah, everybody, yeah. Everybody's going to be there in April? <laughs> Jerry, you going to be there in April? Uh, <clears throat> good question. Don't know. Okay, that's, that's oh, wise. That's wise. Never, never overpromise. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> work gets in the way. There you exactly. go. I also yeah. work in the advertising industry. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. I'm a location scout manager. Oh, are you? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what I do during my day. Oh, nice, nice, yeah. nice. As we should in, talk. Intern by yeah. night. Intern no, we should by talk. Night. <laughs> Even though this is a day shoot, so I don't know what's really And then I'm a concert there. photographer, then I'm an event photographer, and it's like whatever. So. Yeah, you, and which we're going to put this picture up. This is an <laughs> epic Mike Tyson picture that we're going to have. Yes. Oh, you didn't yeah. show my favorite Justin Bieber one. Oh, I, yes, we have that one. That's my guy. I oh, toured yeah. him for no, years. No, the one where he's singing to a handful of uh, iPhones. Oh, is yeah. that one up there? Oh, yeah. That Hold on. Where, where, there was that? where was that? The Danforth Music Hall. I used to be the house photographer there for five years. Okay, I know Adam and all those guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, great guys. Oh, yeah. That was the charity show he did. Yeah. For uh, the food mission out in Stratford. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been doing that since you're 12? Five yeah, years? something like that, yeah, because I'm only 17 <laughs> My now. My goodness, this guy yeah. is just a prodigy. Unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> um, unbelievable. Yeah. I, I, uh, I was the first guy to work with Justin Bieber. I some good. I have some really good Bieber stories. Okay, hey, I'll tell you what. Let's we're gonna l- go back. L- let's let's yeah. go back. Let's go back. For, I know we're, we're expecting a snowstorm soon. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but let, let's go right into uh, one of your uh, most memorable Bieberlicious stories. <laughs> well, I'll go into one story of how I met Justin Bieber. Okay, okay nice. Let's do it. Let's I mean, do there's it. girls everywhere that want to know that story. So I'll tell you. Oh, I got so many Bieber stories. So I was on tour back in 2000 and maybe eight or nine. With the Jabberwockies. Oh, hey, hey, Case. shout out. So we were touring them across Canada. So we were in Winnipeg on a Monday night in December. Weather similar to today, minus 30 and snowing. It's Winnipeg, typical weather oh, in yeah. Winnipeg. And we had a buddy of mine who owned a bar. Small, uh, decent sized bar, six, 700 person bar. And there was an upstairs. So after the show, he said, look, come by my bar. We'll hang out. I'll open up the club for you guys. Just, you know, if you want to bring some girls or you want to, the group, the crew wants to come back, we'll just hang out 30, 40 people. So we do. So the owner of the bar, Sam, uh, the venue was called Blush. It's not there anymore. He goes, hey, I want you to meet someone. And he brings over this guy. This guy's sort of like rough looking dude, all tatted up. And this guy named Jeremy, right? Jeremy Bieber being J- Justin's dad, who's mm-hmm. mm. gone on to be a, a good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And so... Produced that really cool show or the documentary the doc, Bodyguards yeah. on Netflix. Well, actually, my, my, I'll tell you that story too. Oh, my okay. friend's the one who funded it. Oh, amazing. Um, that was very well done. That's I connected cool. him with the guy who financed that that mm-hmm. film. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, so uh, I meet Jer- Jeremy. He's a bit of a rough around the edges type of guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's got this kid with him who looks like he's seven years old. And he's like, uh, that's my son. Uh, he just signed Usher. And he's going to be the biggest thing in the world. And at the time, no one knew Bieber. Like, nobody knew who he was. So I'm with these Jabberwockies, who we were selling out like 3,000 person venues with them. Wow. They were big. This is after America's Best Dance Group. So they were big. Um, and I'm with a couple of friends of mine from California that managed them. And um, I'm like thinking in my head, what's this guy talking about? I'm in Winnipeg on a Monday night. There's a seven year old kid at a bar at one in the morning. Like the whole situation is <laughs> very just random, very weird. And yeah. now he's telling me his son's the next big thing and he signed to Usher. Like, this guy's just. Off his He's rocker, like, and then yeah. a couple of gremlins. And I'm in, in, and I'm in Winnipeg. So you're like, <laughs> you hear the stories about Winnipeg. I'm like, this is yes. this is securing the stories I've heard. <laughs> so he goes, you want to hear my son sing? So I like the, I like a good joke. I'm, I'm one to like call a guy's bluff, right? I go, yeah, sure. So he goes downstairs, and there's a stage that's in the venue, and they have him play. I think it was an Usher song actually. And uh, Justin, Justin was about twelve or thirteen approximately but he looked like he was eight or nine and he grabs the mic and he just goes and we all just stop 
and we're like, oh my God, this kid is good. And there's like 30 people there. He had swag. He had confidence I hadn't seen. And he just went with it. And we were like, holy shit. Wow. This kid is bad. So that was in December. So now fast forward sort of six months later, I used to do a festival every year in Toronto and Halifax called Summer Rush. And I get a call from the record label and they're like, are you near a TV? And dude, by some fluke, I'm at home. I don't know why I was at home, but it was like five o'clock. I'm like, yeah, I'm at home. He goes, put on Much Music right now. I put on Much Music and there's 5,000 girls outside of Much Music where this live, intimate and interactive with some guy named Justin Bieber. Mm -hmm. At the time, I didn't remember his name, right? Mm Because I saw this kid for 10 minutes. And as soon as he gets on the stage there, I'm like, oh, it's the kid I met in Winnipeg six months ago. So the record label calls me. They're like, listen, we need you to do us a big favor. We need you to put him on your music festivals next month in August. And I was like, "Uh, yeah, it looks like uh, I'm going to have to, but what's going to cost? You know, I'm kind of already, my festival's already been announced. They're like, "Uh, $2,000 a show. I'm like, okay, you know what? (laughs) Let's do it. Yeah. So we book them for these shows a month later, and the ticket sales on the festivals actually weren't strong. They were at about 60% sold. As soon as we announced Bieber, we sold out the, the festivals. Mm-hmm. So first show was in Halifax, and Sam, the guy that works for me, used to live in Halifax when he was on the show. He's moved back to Toronto, but he was my head driver. He actually did a lot of security and driving out there. He just knew all the guys um, out there. So he goes to pick up Bieber with me, and as soon as Justin gets in the pickup truck... Uh, Because it was just Justin, his mom, his guitar player, and a road manager. It was only four of them traveling, right? As soon as Justin gets in the truck, he goes, Oh my God, it's the Greasy Caveman from Trailer Park Boys. I'm a huge fan. (laughs) (laughs) So we get to the venue, and Justin was supposed to perform at about 4 or 5 o'clock. And the festival, the the headliner was going to go on at, I think, 9, 30, 10. And in festivals, I don't know if you guys know this, it gets political with the bands because I don't want to open up before him. And yep, right. I sold my records, get me on him. And then if you book an artist six months out, but let's say he blows up and he's massive in six months, then he wants to be repositioned at the top. Yes. It's a mess, right? Yeah. So we're doing this festival. And I knew right away when we got into the venue, the first 3,000 girls at the concert, at the festival in Halifax were all with Justin Bieber fans because he had shirts and signs and everything. So I knew we were going to have a problem. So at about 4 o'clock, 4.30 before he's about to go on, I, you know, I go to the owner of the radio station. I go, look, we can't put him on. So we put him on. We, have, we run the risk of a couple thousand girls leaving after they see him perform. You have to be careful, right? Right. So we're going to have to push him back. So we put him on. Uh, I go up to him and I go, listen. I said, Justin, I got good news and bad news. I said, good news is this. We're going to put you on later, which means it's better for you. I said, the yeah. bad news is you got to wait two more hours here in the dressing room. And he was young and naive. It was his first show. So he's like, oh, it's cool. That's cool. And I said, look, I go, I feel bad. Because at the time, his rider was water and juice. And that was it. There was yeah. like towels. That was it. Not even food. So I go, look, man, let me buy you dinner. At least. Like, please. And he goes, really? He goes, you know what, man? I haven't had Swiss chalet in almost a year. Can you get me a quarter chicken dinner with a Caesar salad? I'm like, bro, it would be my pleasure. I'm going to get you two. Because in a year from now, that rider's going to be like this yes, long. Yeah. So fair enough, sure enough, I got him the um, the sous chalet. That was, that was pretty much his rider. It was really easy. With extra dipping sauce. <laughs> I didn't even get him the extra dipping sauce. Oh, I should have. Oh, <laughs> but I got him, actually, I got him two dinners just to give him extra food. So, yeah. so that was the first time I worked with Biebs. Um, then we toured with him a few times. Became really good friends with him. Um, he actually said to me, he was like, dude, I want you to be my, my road manager because he was in the process of doing a global tour six months down the line. And he was like, Neil, he's like, I really want you to be my, my road manager. I want, you know, I want to talk to my manager and bring you on board. And uh, I, I wasn't interested for many people are like, why are you crazy? But I'm like, it goes back to that unrewarding, man. I would have been traveling 200 days, wouldn't see my family, overworked, underpaid. You're accountable for everything. And, uh, and so I kind of was like, nah, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of good. Um, and then, uh, but I had a good relationship with like him and his team and his management. A couple of funky things happened along the way that sort of kind of grew my bond with his team. Mm-hmm. So we've always been good and really, really tight. And then him, his dad and I became really close friends. And then I sort of toured him. I did a, another big thing. I think I mentioned this to you before. Yes. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> we, um, oh yes. What, one of the things that I did is, so I, I think I mentioned earlier that you know, I was always looking for ways to 
uh, help out the record labels who just their budgets were kind of going down. So Universal Music bought a, a clothing company called Bravado, and they sell all the merchandise for all the musicians, the artists. And uh, I had a friend of mine who owned a company at the time called Urban Behavior, the clothing stores, right? Mm, which is still around, right? Uh, no. Well, if it is, it, it went bankrupt uh, oh, it did? a couple years ago. Okay. So it did get bought by someone. But Stitches is still around, right? That's who bought it. Oh, it did? <laughs> yeah. The guys that own like Stitches and stuff yeah, bought it. Okay. Um, but at the time, the company was massive. Massive company. So um, I went to the owner because he was trying – because what had happened was the owner, Forever 21 was coming in and Urban uh, Outfitters – a lot of competition yeah. so i said you know what man i said we should uh we should try and do this thing i got access to this kid justin bieber he's really big so he ended up doing a massive massive deal where he bought like thirty thousand justin bieber shirts and put them in all his stores and in exchange i was able to negotiate where i could do uh five mall appearances with justin bieber across canada to promote the 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 shirts being in the stores exclusively, and then I would do two concerts: one in Vancouver, one in Toronto. And that's when that's when Bieber got those crazy crowds at the mall, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that doesn't it. the mall doesn't have the infrastructure to oh, handle that. I don't think yeah. anyone does. It was yeah. And then you know what? It's not even the kids; it's the parents are worse than the kids. Oh as yes, you guys we know, know that. Right. You know that. Yeah. So um, we did these we did these shows, but again, he was. It was interesting because. It was like literally weeks before he blew up. He was already big. But I mean, like when I say weeks before he blew up, like two weeks after this tour, he was on the MTV Awards. He was on the cover of, I think it was either Billboard or People Magazine has, you know. So he was like, I'm, I'm, I'm around this. I'm watching it. I mean, when we were driving around from London to Toronto, he wanted to be in my truck. We had a really good bond. He wanted to sit next to me on the airplanes all the time. We just had a good little vibe to us, right? Because yeah. I'm immature and we would always kind of goof around and play around. I was trying to actually sell his plane tickets on eBay. But his managers caught wind and they're like, you can't sell those. I'm like, they're not good anymore. I go, let's see how much we can get for these. Right. But they shut me down. So just childish <laughs> yeah. things, right? Yeah. Crank called people, him and I. Was, we had some fun. I mean, we snuck him out of Vaughn Mills in a hockey bag. <laughs> you put him in the hockey <laughs> bag. Put him in a hockey bag. There was like 5,000 people and they saw our vans. So we just put him in a, in a van. Uh in the van, in the hockey bag. I mean, bag did, you have a, did you have a security detail or you just, just stuffed him in the bag and said, let's go? Yeah, we had like... I mean, we had a, a bit of a security detail, but it wasn't to the level of professionalism right, and right. sort of uh, that you guys would provide. These right, are services right. we can add. And, right, the hockey right. bag. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, not every, you know, you know. This, this was ten years ago. Ten years ago, we didn't know how big it was going to be. I mean, I don't think we expected six, seven thousand people showing up, and it's just it was sort of organized chaos at best. But the, in terms of security detail. I don't think I even had that experience to really... I've never experienced anything like that, nor did a lot of the people we work with. For sure. Um, so it was it was pretty crazy. But yeah, we snuck about hockey bags. <laughs> and, what a sight. That's um, a, is there, it would be amazing if there's video evidence. Of that. I know. Just, <laughs> you know. He He seems like the guy that would want to jump in it. And, oh, but, dude, but he, he was, probably loved every second of it. Oh, he did, man. He yeah. was No, he was a cool kid. I mean, very smart. We were... We, we went to this one mall signing and he got like 20 Rubik's Cubes. I'm like, what's with the Rubik's Cubes? He goes, oh, I, I like Rubik's Cubes. I, I like solving them. I go, you know, he was 14. I go, you know how to solve them? He goes, yeah, watch. Yeah. Wow. Done. Yeah. Like he's a smart kid. Like yes. he is not just uh, oh, a for great sure. performer. Intelligent, yeah. like yeah. extremely intelligent. Um, and uh, so funny enough, so we're, I get him out of the hockey bag. So we're goofing around. We're in a 15 passenger van. So him and I are play fighting. And I could see little snippets of Justin, like he's 14, 15, he's one of the biggest artists in the world. So sometimes you'd have a little bit of an ego on him. Yeah. So one time, uh, we're in the back of the bus, or the uh, 15 passenger van, and I'm on top of him, and he kicks me right in the face. And I look at him, and he gives me this look like, what? Like, you can't, you can't do anything. I'm, I'm, he's, yeah. this is like my he's show. Like, he's serious. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, we were playing, no, no, but you know yeah. when you he's play? He's testing it, you're yeah. testing it. Yeah. He's yeah. testing it, right? Like, this you know when you play, like, yeah. you know, that saying your parents just say, like, someone's going to get hurt. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So we're goofing around, but I think a little thing went off, so you want to test me, so he kicks me right in my face, right? Yeah. I'm like this. So I look at him to see, I don't know if he meant to do it per se, but I knew he kind of did, but, you know, you're not sure. And he gives me this look, like, no no apology, and just gives me, this, gives me this look, and I'm just like, what was that for? He goes, because. I'm like, all right. <laughs> so I hop over the back seat. <laughs> I hop over the back seat and I grab him and I fish hook his mouth Oh, and I yeah. pull it and I get into his ear and I go, listen, I, go, I don't care who you are. I go, I don't work for you. I go, I don't care how big you're going to be. I go, you do that again. I'm going to rip your friggin' mouth off. Yeah. I go, and I don't care. 
And then he was screaming. He's like, ah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Mom. And, 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 and I let him go. And, uh, and, and that was it. That's good, yeah, man. Don't damage his vocal cords. Don't damage his vocal cords. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did, you know, like, I did just enough to let him know. Yes. Yeah, but not good. enough to get in trouble to be like, you just ripped my son's mouth. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's we had... testing. I mean, that's what, that's what young men do. They try to, you know, they need a forum. Dude, in order, they, they need to feel, you know. We were on the plane and he had his legs up on the chair in front of him. And the stewardess was like, can you please put your feet down? He wouldn't do it. So she didn't know who he was Uh so she walks back over like the third time and she goes, if I tell you one more time to put them down, you'll be off this plane. And he was testing her, right? So I just looked at him. I'm like, dude, put your feet down, bro. But yeah, he was testing. Yeah. He was testing a lot of people back then. Yeah, I mean, because he's working. I mean, like, I mean, we sympathize with it because, you know, we work with talent all the time in, the, in those circles. I mean, if, if any of us had our, you know, our, our high school days, our adult, young adolescent days documented, if we were working, if we had a hundred adults working for us, I mean, it's a tough pressure. It's tough pressure. He just needed a place just to be silly, to be stupid, you know. Just hundred percent. That's exactly. Bro. That's all. I and mean, I guess you you gave him an out, you know. I definitely. Did. Yeah. 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 And I set did. him straight at the same time. Yeah. No. And that's why um, I think he's gone through a lot of dark moments is because he's emotionally a strong kid. He's not stupid. Mm-hmm. See, a lot of artists, um, they kind of don't. They don't have social awareness. So it doesn't bother them what they're doing. They kind of just go through it. I was always worried for him because I knew he was smarter than most artists I've been around. And he's from a small town and he's in LA and traveling around the world. And like you mentioned, like you're bang on. So when he was going through some of those dark moments, I was not surprised and I was really felt for him because I knew that everyone was kind of like talking crap about him. And I'm like, yo, this kid's 20, like 18. I did worse things at that age and I didn't even have a hundredth of what he has. Yes. Um, so to see what he's gone through and where he is, I'm really happy for him because I yeah. know he went through some dark stuff and I don't think, I think he was just a victim of circumstance, but uh, it looks like he's in a better place, so. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, look, we learned a lot from you today, man. A lot. We learned we learned who the man, yeah. the marketing guru, as they say, <laughs> is. Thank you so much for coming down, man. We really appreciate it. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, you got some weather to battle back home. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah. Well, I'm going to the office. Ten minute drive. I'm good. Are you? Okay. Yeah. Nice. nice, man. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're uh, really excited that you know got to hear a little uh, you know snippet of some of the great things yeah. doing in the city. And, Thank uh, you. It's fun reminiscing sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll cook something up as you're talking, and just we're all about ideas, opportunities. There's some ideas I want to run by you. Cool. And then if you think it's got some legs, we can make something happen. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. It was Absolutely. fun. Okay. Awesome. All right, um, and I appreciate you having me on after Joel. You know, you saved the best for last. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the last word. Yeah. Oh, hold on. There Joel's calling me right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Okay. All right, man. Thanks. Okay, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Peace. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you, guys. Make sure to drop by next week. Let's go. go, 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 go. And don't forget to subscribe. Let's go. It's time to give a shout out to our sponsors. This podcast is brought to you by Sentinel Security Plus. For all your premium security needs, visit SentinelSecurityPlus.com. We got some questions for you. you, What do you stand for? Slow trickle. What's up? It's Mike. Hey, what's going down, man? Great news. We're at 22 subscribers. Incredible. Imagine if we had a few million. Well, our guest next week, Sean Ward, has over 3 million subscribers, and he's taken over YouTube. Holy moly, Batman!